very grateful to be back and, and grateful to be uh, preaching today. If you have a copy of God's Word, we'll be in Daniel chapter 3. We're in a series in the book of Daniel, and uh, this it will be familiar to you if you grew up in church. I was in church nine months before I was born, and so I, I was in this thing called Sunday school. I don't know if you know about Sunday school, but it, as if Monday through Friday wasn't enough, they put you in a basement before church, church before church. So like, it wasn't like you guys get here barely on time now. Imagine having to be here 90 minutes before the church service starts and sit with a, a teacher. And they use this thing. This is before Wi-Fi, before big screens, skinny jeans and haze machines. Like this is old school church. There was this thing called a flannel graph. You don't know nothing. You will not go to heaven if you don't know about flannel graph. So I'm on a mission to teach people about a flannel graph. All week long, faithful Sunday school teachers with arthritis in their hands from cutting out the characters would, would cut out these characters. And then when they would teach, they would use this board. It was like magic, but you can't believe in magic because we're Christians. But you know, it was like church magic, you know, and they would st stick these characters on the wall and they would teach you the principles of God on this flannel graph. And Daniel uh, chapter three would have been in that with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, these three Hebrew boys stood up against a, a very narcissistic king who wanted uh, everyone to bow at this golden idol that he had made of himself. And what Sunday school does is it teaches you the big concept, but what I like to do is go a little bit deeper and teach you in some of the nuance as these three Hebrew boys get thrown into the fiery furnace because they refuse to bow down to the golden idol that the king had made. And so I'd like to preach to you today at all of our locations, a message titled, The Purpose in the Furnace. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's purpose in the furnace. There's purpose in the furnace. And, and for the next several moments that we have together, I want to stir up your faith to believe that God is for you and not against you. I want to stir up your faith to, for you to know that God goes before you and he remains behind you, that he goes beside you, that he plucked you out of the miry clay and he sets your feet on solid rock and he gives you what's called the shield of faith, the book of Ephesians says, to extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. So we have to face the fire sometimes, I don't know if you're going through fire before, maybe you've gone through some things, maybe you're going through some things right now. I'm here to stir your faith in the season that you are in that is consuming your life. I pray that you would find faith for the furnace and the fire that you're going through. Maybe you got laid off. Maybe there's a separation in your relationship. Maybe there's some discord in your family. Maybe there are financial difficulties. Maybe you've gotten bad news from the doctor. I don't know what fire you're going through today, but I'm here on a mission to build your faith at every location. So the first question we have to ask before we get into the passage is the fire within me greater than the furnace before me. That'll, that'll preach right there. Is the fire within me greater than the furnace that is before me? Is there fire in your life that allows you to live boldly and to trust God fully in the seasons of your life? See, fasting, as we're doing as a church right now, it increases the fire within me. But as I increase the fire within me, the enemy also turns up the heat against me. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that when you get serious about the things of God, the devil gets serious about the things in your life. He's not worried about neutral, lukewarm, mediocre believers. But when you turn up the heat in the presence of God, when you say no to the flesh and yes to the spirit, it, why do I always get a flat tire when I'm fasting? I don't believe the devil's behind every bush. I don't know if you grew up like that. It's like, no, you stubbed your toe because you didn't put your Crocs on when you took out the trash. Should have put your Crocs on. The devil is not to blame for everything, but there is a war waging 
in principalities that you don't see, the unseen realm. And so is the fire within you, your passion for God, your trust in God, your faith in God, is the fire within me greater than the furnace before me? So we're going to look at three characters. I'm going to try my best to get through this. It's, we're trying our best to go verse by verse, but it's just so much meat in the message, you know? Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar, this is the king who made an image of himself, was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. And he ordered some of the strongest men of his armies to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and they threw them in to the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king, in his anger, had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. How many men did they throw in? Come on now. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, tied up, bound up, locked down, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly, oh, we serve a suddenly God. Oh, there are some days that feel like decades and some decades that feel like days. God will do some stuff seasonally and he will do some stuff suddenly. And you, I declare over your life, whatever fire you are walking in right now, that you, we serve a suddenly God who can turn it around in a second where you could blink and it could change, where one prayer can change a life. One word from God can change your perspective. But suddenly, King Nebuchadnezzar jumped. He got the king on his feet in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did. I've got the inventory. Three Hebrew boys into the furnace. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed and the fourth looks like a god <laughs> what he didn't know is that just wasn't a god <laughs> that was the god it wasn't just a healer it was the healer it wasn't just a deliverer it was the deliverer it wasn't just a provider it was the provider it was jehovah jireh jehovah nisi jehovah shalom it was the lily of the valley the bright and morning star the rose of sharon the alpha the omega this wasn't a god it was the god and when the god steps into the fire that you're in the god has the the ability to untie you and allow you to walk around in what was meant to harm you. I ain't even finished yet. Look like a God. No, no, no. I don't serve a God. <laughs> I serve the God. <laughs> you can serve Buddha. You can serve Joseph Smith. You can serve Allah. That's a God. I serve the God. You can serve your gemstones. You can serve your horoscope. I don't serve a God. I serve the God. And my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and his glory. Joseph Smith can't do that. Buddha can't do that. Mm. But suddenly, where am I at? Verse 25, 26. We've got a lot of verses. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could. See, people who were once against you are going to lean in to watch your testimony. They're going to say, what, what, what are they doing in there? We lost soldiers putting them in there. How in the world? How he could to the door of the flaming furnace and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And look what he calls them now. Servants. Oh, how the turns have tabled. He was just a God a couple of verses ago. Now he's, they are servants of what? The most high God. Come out and come here. Whew. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, people of influence, fancy people wearing suits and ties and important people that have drivers and stuff. Then the high, high officers and officials, governors and advisors, they crowded around them. God is going to position your testimony in places and in rooms of great influence. 
And they're not going to see you before you go through the trial, but they're going to see you after you go through the trial. And they saw that the fire had not touched them. Look at this, very specific. Not a hair on their head was singed and, and their clothing was not scorched. Look at this. They didn't even smell. <sighs> they didn't even smell of smoke. God will, will, will extinguish every remnant of the trial that you will never look back and see yourself in the same eye. You won't even be able to smell it. Whatever season you're going through, you won't even be able to smell it. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, look at, the, look, at, look, at, look, at, look at it changing. Look at his tune changing. Bow to me. Now he's like, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. Turn to your neighbor and say, I trust him. They defied the king's command. You're going to have to learn to do this in the coming days in Babylon. You're going to have to defy the king's command. And they were willing to die rather than serve or worship any God except their own. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn from limb to limb. King Nebuchadnezzar ain't playing around. All right, throw them in the fire. And if they go against the God, rip them to shreds. And their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no God. This is King Nebuchadnezzar. This is not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is the king who threw them in. He's like, there's no God that can rescue like this. You know it's God when your enemies start worshiping the same God that you've been worshiping all along. When the same people who threw you into the fire start to receive the fire, then they start to worship in a new way. Look what happens as a result. I haven't even started preaching yet. Then the king promoted. <laughs> Are you serious right now? Why am I going through this? I don't know. Maybe there's a promotion on the other side of this problem. Maybe there's something on the other side of this you don't even know. about. You were just trying to survive in the fire. And God says, you're not just going to survive. I'm going to elevate you at the end of that. You are about to receive ascension at a new higher place. It says, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to an even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Let us pray. Father, we love your word. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We are grateful that our faith extinguishes the fiery darts of the enemy. No weapon formed against us shall prosper today. Thank you because the fire that is within me is greater than the furnace that is before me. I thank you because there is no idol. There is no statue. There is no God that can save like you can. There is no one that can replace who you are. Use the preaching and teaching of your word today. You are the life and you are the truth. And we follow you today. We surrender to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sometimes you go through testing seasons. Have you ever gone through a testing season before? You ever gone through a trial by fire? You, you know, uh, it's interesting. Anytime you, you like turn up the heat in your spiritual life, the devil turns up the heat against you. And uh, I was doing some research about how they used to test airplanes before technology, like back in the day when it was a risk to fly. You know, like nowadays we just get in there and we complain that there's no Wi-Fi. We forget that we're flying like so fast, 30,000 feet up in the air in a little metal tube with some pretzels, you know. Back in the day before there was technology to test these planes, I read that in order to replicate a bird strike, which is when a plane runs into a bird after it's taken off and it can damage the engine. It happened uh, on the Hudson River in New York. You, they, they go through a, a, a flock of birds unintentionally and it damages the engine. What they, what they made was a chicken cannon, frozen chicken, okay? They made a chicken cannon and they would turn the engines on while the plane is on the ground, and they would shoot frozen chickens like, <laughs> at the engine to see what the damage would be to replicate a bird strike in the air. I thought that was fascinating. First of all, because I haven't had chicken in a couple days. So I was like, man, it sounds so good. Uh, let's thaw out one of those chickens instead of shooting it at, like, why are we wasting, <laughs> why are we wasting good food? You know, say there are people... In, in, not even in Africa that are hungry. There are people right here that are hungry. You know what I'm saying? Like, I need that food. What I realized is that 
If you can be tested on the ground, you can be trusted in the air. (laughs) God will test you in small things so that he could trust you with big things. Now, the enemy will also test you in small things, and then eventually he'll start testing you in the big things. It says that King Nebuchadnezzar, when they come to report and tell, uh, you know, why are they telling on them, first of all? If you're bowing down, shouldn't you be worried about your own bowing down? Why are you telling on me? You must be looking, you must be praying with your eyes open. You ever, you ever, kid, like, you didn't close your eyes when you were praying. How'd you know? (laughs) Same is true for these three Hebrew boys. You didn't bow down. How'd you know? What, why does my worship concern you? (laughs) Don't judge my praise. If you really were bowing down to the golden image, then you wouldn't be worried about my standing up. But so many people get consumed and obsessed with what other people do. That when the time comes, so it says that that he never bowed down to any of the gods that he had or the idol that he made. So they had trials leading up to the big one where big golden image of King Nebuchadnezzar, very narcissistic leader. And he had already put them in charge. So they already had position and the king had placed them there. How many of you know some things, some relationships come with strings attached? (laughs) King Nebuchadnezzar like, you're already in charge of the province in Babylon. Go ahead and just bow down. Oh, well, I, I, it doesn't work that way, sir. You put me here because of my skill. You don't, I, don't, I don't do the things back door like you want me to do. I don't do things under the table like that. There are no strings attached to my commitment to serve you. And what King Nebuchadnezzar says is like, come on now, bow down. You're, you're, part, of my, you're part of my leadership team. You're part of my, 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 and you have to know when to stand. Young people, you have to know when to stand. You have to know when your friends are using you for their own advancement. King Nebuchadnezzar was using these three Hebrew boys for his own advancement, and they defied the commands because they actually had a backbone, which seems to be missing lately. And I want to encourage you today to strengthen your faith for the furnace that is ahead of you. Strengthen your faith. See, the purpose in the furnace is to strengthen my faith. My faith is meant to be strengthened today. I'm here to strengthen your faith. Mark 9, 49 says, for everyone who is everyone. It didn't just say the pastors. Didn't just say those who speak in tongues. Didn't just say those who, who have gone to Bible school. Everyone will be tested with fire. If you've never been tested with fire, <laughs> you haven't been living very long. The longer I live, the harder the tests become. The the, the longer I live, the more crafty the enemy becomes to try to convince me of things that are not of God. And he'll do it subtly, and then he'll do it obviously. Starts with little gods, and then it gets to the big God. But what I've realized about faith, if you're writing notes today, you can write this down. If you're not taking notes today, you can write this down. Faith doesn't keep you from the fire, but it does Keep you on your feet. Your faith isn't a fire repellent. When you got saved, you didn't put a shield around you that says the enemy won't attack you. As a matter of fact, I have learned that the more I lean in, the more he leans in on me. If you have decided to follow Jesus, your life will get better, but it won't get easier. Now I just have someone to trust in the fire. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to go through the fire. It just means I have someone to trust in the fire. And faith doesn't keep me from the fire, but it sure does keep me on my feet. Oh, oh. I'm learning to stand firm in the trials of the enemy. I'm learning to stand firm in the tests uh, that come against me. And this is what they said. This is when they tattled because they're little tattletales on the, on the, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 12. But there are, some, there are some, some Jews. Notice how they always use ethnicity to degrade or belittle. They didn't say Shadrach, Meshach, and they didn't call them by name. Now, these were leaders in Babylon. And they said, look, there are some Jews whom whom you have set over the affairs of the province in Babylon. Now they use their name. Isn't it interesting how they qualify 
their tattling by using their ethnicity. And here at this church, we've just shattered that and we continue to do so and we will continue to work for that. But here at this church, we will never qualify you based on the amount of melon that is in your skin, melanin that is in your skin. Like, that's not how, how it works around. If, you're, if you think for a minute something disqualifies you or qualifies you based on the color of your skin, you're at the wrong church. I got plenty of other I can send you to. You probably came from them. I don't know. That wasn't even in my nose. I just felt that. You know what I'm saying? So then they use their name, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. That just sounds like a tattle. They just pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Can I tell you right now what we need in this day and time are people that will stand up because if you don't stand, who else will? This is what I wrote in my notes. If you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. And if you fall for anything, you'll bow to everything. You'll be like the wind. Oh, this way, this week. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm for this and against that. I'm for this and I'm against that. And you, this way you meet, go in another circle. You're like, I'm for this and I'm against that. Stand for something. Find a a biblical foundation in your worldview so that you're not like Gumby when it comes to the values that you hold. Just so, so many Christians Gumby, man. Gumby would melt in the fire. Gumby didn't have no backbone. There was no vertebrae. I'm looking for a church that'll stand up and put on, it says in Ephesians 6.13, I got a lot to cover today. I haven't been here for two weeks, so you're going to get three weeks worth of sermons. The week before last, last week, and this week, all in one. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be what? Say it like you mean it. You will still be what? Standing firm. Standing firm. Guess what we will be as a church? We will be people. We will be stand-up people in a bow-down world. That's a stand-up guy. You ever heard them say that? You're a stand-up guy. I like you. You're a stand-up guy. Stand-up guy. You ever, heard, you ever heard somebody say that? He's a stand-up guy. We better be a stand-up church. Stand-up guy right there. I know he goes to crunch. I know he goes to crunch every single day. I see you. Stand-up guy. Stand-up guy in a bow-down world. Stand-up fathers in a fatherless generation. Stand up husbands where the divorce rate is out of control. Stand up men of God and women of God that believe in the promises of God that stand through the fire. We will be stand up people in a bow down world. Put that lower third back up there. I want us to say that out loud. One, two, three. We will be stand up people in a bow down world. Whew. I'm not going to be there when your boss tells you you can't bring your Bible to work no more. I'm not going to be there, young person, when they say you can't have that prayer gathering around the flagpole at your school. I'm not going to be there when they start to teach you all sorts of ideologies and confusion. You're going to have to learn how to stand up. I'm going to do my best in the 28 minutes and 30 seconds they give me every single week to give you everything I got. But you're going to have to face the test. Faith gives you strength to walk out of the things that you got thrown into. My next no, faith gives you Faith gives you strength to walk out of the things that you got thrown into. Isn't it awesome that in verse 27, they, the high officers and official governors and advisors crowded around them and they saw that the fire had not touched them, nor a hair on their head had been singed and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell like smoke. They walked out of what they were thrown into. Whoo! You walk different once you've gone through some things. I, have you ever been to court? at all of our location. You ever been to court? Court's the worst. It's up there with the DMV. It's worse than the DMV. I was in a lawsuit and I had to go to court and court is the worst. I don't wish court upon anybody. I was in a lawsuit. Somebody tried to sue my family. It was a landlord who claimed that we had been having church in our home, which was not true. This was when the church was like 400 people, and we, our house couldn't hold 400 people, sir. He claimed that we had ruined the plumbing because there were so many people using the, the bathroom. I'm like, sir, I have three children, all right? They're all potty trained, okay? We, 
A lot of people live here, you know. He had sneakily gone into the house and taken pictures with his Android phone. So they were blurry. <laughs> Dismissed in court. Bad evidence. The evidence has been tampered with. Just kidding. Relax. I see you, Android users. You're like, we were going to tie today, but now we're putting our... I'm keeping my cash app on my Android phone. Thank you very much. When we left town, he said, I'll cover the grass and cut the grass for you. He lived next door, which is a terrible place for the landlord to live. He charged us $300 per time he cut the grass. Now, this wasn't a farm, okay? It wasn't even a full acre, all right? We're not, he said, so in the court documents, he had like 48 pages of pictures that he had taken. I uh, said that we had never uh, paid for a pet deposit. All the while, when we first toured the home, we brought our dog with us. But he started playing dumb as if he didn't know we had a dog. So he, he, for the five years we lived there, never missed a rent payment. He claimed that we never paid a pet deposit, so he tried to charge us monthly for the pet deposit. Then he said he, came in, he went in with a black light. Crazy people. Not just on the carpet. This is where your dog, you know, went. It was like all over the wall. He's like, this is crazy. Did you, you guys have ruined my house. Blah, 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 blah. $20,000 took me to court. Court is no fun. It's no fun. So now my mom told me I could be a lawyer. She's like, you're so convinced that you could be a lawyer. I was like, well, I'm not one. I'm a preacher. I'm going to convince them about the gospel. All right. And I'll let God be the judge. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and, uh, so I called, I didn't take legal representation because it's expensive. And, but I called my friend who's a lawyer. I said, what should I do? And he said, you need to write a letter to the judge and you walk in there and you read the letter. And I said, why do I read the letter? He said, because what he's going to do, the landlord, is he's going to get emotional and he's going to start to lash out and say things and, and, and start to accuse of all sorts of stuff that didn't happen. He said, but if you remove the emotion and you just approach the judge with a letter, that judge will see how poised you are and how spastic the landlord is, and he'll be able to see that the landlord is not telling the truth because you just, and he, he said, when you get there, just read the letter. So I put on my suit and tie. I found a briefcase at the thrift store. <laughs> I mean, I've seen enough Matlock to know you don't go to court without a briefcase. Come on now. You don't, go to, you don't go to court without a briefcase. I didn't have a brief. I just picked up a briefcase at the thrift store, donated it back right after the case was over, you know, with the click, click, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> just one sheet of paper in the briefcase, just that letter. <laughs> and I was nervous, man. I sat in that courtroom and I heard all these eviction cases and I heard people who were really going through a hard time and, and they hadn't paid rent in, you know, six months and eight months and people who, who were being poorly treated by their landlord and people who had neglected to do their part of the lease and both sides, you know, and it was my turn and he called me up and landlord is sitting over there. We don't make eye contact. We're on both sides. You know how, you know, it's like drama, you know, Judge Judy, you know. He's got this pile of things, and he's accusing me of all things, and the judge is looking through these Android photos, and it's like, and he goes, sir, do you have anything to say? And I took a deep breath, and I just read that letter word for word, and I had in that letter uh, that we had never missed a rent payment, and that uh, all, the, all of the proof. It was, it, was, it, was a, it was a scam. The guy had threatened to go to the Assemblies of God and remove my credentials, uh, which is like our denomination, our fellowship that I'm a part of. Uh, he said, I'm going to go to the News and Observer. He's like, I'm going to shut down your church. I'm like, dude, the church has existed for 2,000 years. Do you think you could shut down the church? You really think the devil has been trying to shut down the church for a lot longer than you have, and he has still failed. Either way, I had screenshots of those text messages that he had threatened my family and threatened to my livelihood and my reputation, slander, whatever it is. And I got done reading my letter. Very great. It was a, if, it was a great letter, okay? <laughs> the judge asked one question. He said, how old was the carpet when they moved in? My landlord told the truth, and he said it was eight years old when they moved in. And we had lived there for five years. He wanted us to pay to replace 13-year-old carpet that was eight years old when we moved in, which is illegal. He should have changed it before we moved in, technically. I'm not here to talk about renting. All right. And the judge said, are you kidding me? 
And I rem- I'll never forget this. He said, sir, this case is dismissed. And he put the gavel. I'm getting somewhere. Relax. I know you're thinking. You're like, we got to go to lunch. Hang on. I walked into that courtroom nervous, man. I mean, I was like, I don't have 20 grand. Still don't have 20 grand. I don't know how I'm going to do this. But the way I walked out, once the judgment was served, <laughs> I, let me tell you something. It's, it's a bit, I walked out of that courtroom, boy. <laughs> I've never walked. My chest has never. <laughs> I, I, it was like that law and order closing credits were like rolling over the screen. And me and my briefcase in my suit, I walked out of that. Oh! And I'll never forget this moment. I'll never forget it. At the courthouse, you got to park in the parking garage, walk around the corner downtown there. He was in the same parking garage as me. I'll never forget this. I'll never forget. He got, he was angry. He pulled out of the parking lot before me and I was still walking because I was taking my time now. I'll never, this is the providence of God. No joke. He, it's a red light right there by the parking garage. And as soon as he pulled up, the light was red and the little walking man comes up I made eye contact with the guy who tried to sue me, and I strolled across the street so slow, like chariots of fire, in slow motion, because (laughs) there are some seasons in life where you were tied up when you went in, where you were embarrassed when you went in, when you were nervous when you went in. But on your way out, you will see the faithfulness of God and the judgment of God will dismiss every case against you. The judgment of God will take every accusation and reverse the curse of the enemy. You're going to be able to walk out of that which you got thrown into. I know you've been thrown into the fire, but I came to preach to someone today who says, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. He is the God who oversees every single action of my past, and he orders the steps of the righteous. Give God some praise. Come on, if you walk through fire. All right. Very quickly, I close with this. I got to go. I got a, I got a plane to catch to go to Columbus, Ohio. I walked out of that courthouse, boy. Let me tell you right now. <laughs> oh. You never see me walk like that. Three postures of faith in the fire. The Lord can. You got to believe that. The second is the Lord will. And the third one is, but even if he does not. (laughs) That might need to be on your bathroom mirror this week. The Lord can. The Lord will. But even if he doesn't. See, I trusted God long before I was ever sued. And I trust God long after. I I trusted God long before I ever planted this church. And I'll trust God long after we close it or hand it off or they roll me out of here with a casket. Whatever happens. I just trust God. I trust God because he's been faithful. I trust God because even if he doesn't, he tends to get the glory. So, I love that the king promotes them at the end. Verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. The pathway to promotion is not always popular. There might be some fire involved between this season and next. There might be a furnace involved in this season and next season. But promotion is on the way. And if it's in the hands of God, there are four people in your fire. Promotion is on the way. 
I love what Joseph tells his brothers. He got thrown into a pit. He got his robe taken from him. He gets thrown into prison. He gets wrongly accused for uh, sleeping with Potiphar's wife, which he did not do. And this is what he says in Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. Not for my promotion, but for the saving of many lives. I pray that our stance, our standing in the fire, our stance will save many lives. Oh, see, I, 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 man, I, I got so much. In the New Testament, there's a man named Stephen and rocks are being thrown at him to kill him. He's becoming a martyr. Uh, I used to say that he is stoned, but kids these days, they wouldn't know what that meant. They would get it confused with recreational activities. So I have to say, Stephen is, rocks are being thrown at Stephen. <laughs> it's true. I was a youth pastor one time. They were like, was, was Stephen stoned? I was like, rocks were thrown. Oh, oh, okay. Looking for biblical justification, man. If Stephen did it, you know, we could do it too. So rocks are being thrown at Stephen. Look at this. But Stephen, Acts chapter 7, full of the Holy Spirit, he looks up to heaven. And he saw the glory of God. And look at this. And Jesus, what? What is Jesus doing? Whew. When I see this, this changes everything. Because Stephen was a martyr for his, he was standing up for what he believed in. He was standing up for his faith. And his standing brought about his death. And it brought about a martyr. But it says, and he looks and he saw the glory of God, which is what we want to see every time we come into this house. And he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man. Look what he's doing. Now, other verses say that he's seated. Whew, I'm preaching now. This verse says that he's standing. I think Jesus stands up when you stand up. When I stand for Jesus, Jesus stands with me. At all of our locations, when you stand for Jesus, Jesus stands with you. So if you are facing trial, if you are facing tribulation, just stand. And when you stand, Jesus stands with you. At all of our locations, with every head bowed and every eye closed, you're going through the fire right now. Stand strong. Stand strong right now. If you're going through brokenness in your marriage, stand strong right now. If you're going through a divorce, stand strong right now. If you're going through anxiety, anxious thoughts, stand strong right now. If you are, are trying to, to start a family and, and, and have a child, stand strong right now. If you've lost a child recently, stand strong right now. If you are facing medical conditions that you were, weren't ready for, stand strong right now. Stand strong because when you stand for Jesus... Jesus stands with you. Father, I pray over my church family that are seated at all of our locations. I just pray for the fire of the Holy Spirit to be greater within them than the furnace that they are facing in front of them. Oh God, I ask that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. That their faith would extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. Oh God, help us, Lord. We ask you to be faithful. And we'll be faithful to you. And even if you don't, we'll stand. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Let's clap our hands for the presence of God today. Amen.